Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I am absolutely thrilled because I have the opportunity to meet with somebody who I met a few years back and I was in the audience of his keynote, one of his keynote presentations, and I, I thought it was just fantastic. And so now he's on the show, which is great. Chester Elton was born in Edmonton, Alberta, and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Chester is a proud Canadian and avid hockey fan. Hockey isn't just a game, it's a way of life. His father, John Dalton Elton, has been the most significant influencer in his life and work. He grew up in the happiest house ever, is what he says. The joy for life and family has been the single biggest driver in his work and family. He often quotes his father saying, be good to everyone. Everybody is having a tough day. In his work, he has traveled to over 40 countries teaching about the importance of a healthy culture where people feel valued and appreciated for their work. He believes travel is a wonderful educator and loves experiencing new languages, traditions, and especially their food. With Adrian Gostick, his co-author, they have written 12 books together on culture, leadership, and gratitude in the workplace. Five have been New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestsellers. Their books have sold over 1.6 million copies and have been translated into over 40 languages. Their latest is Leading with Gratitude, Eight Leadership Practices for Extraordinary Business Results. When not writing or speaking on workplace culture, Chester spends his time with his wonderful wife, Heidi, working with their Camp Coral, and in an organization that funds summer camps, summer camps for military family kids. Mentors International that makes micro loans to the poorest of the poor. Ability Beyond that provides care and work for those that have experienced brain trauma, as well as working with the World Bank on their faith-based partnerships to end world poverty. He's a proud father of four exceptional children and two amazing grandchildren, and he enjoys family time at home and hockey games. He's been married to the love of his life, Heidi, for 36 years, and they happily live in Summit, New Jersey. Chester Elton, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I'm ready to get you over the hump. Thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Well, I, and, I, and I have to tell you, when I was in the audience uh, for that keynote presentation, we were throwing a bunch of carrots around having a great time. So I know we're going to have a great time on this interview as well. <laughs> so, but I've shared with my legion a little bit about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? You know, my current passion really is our kids have grown and left home. And so we've got time. It's that season in our life where we've got time to dedicate. And my wife and I have really gotten involved in a lot of charitable work. Uh, you mentioned Camp Corral. It's uh, sponsored by the, by the um, best buffet in the USA, Golden Corral. And we've had great fun with that over the summers where military kids get to go to camp for free. And we go out there and we, we paint with them. We, we advise on that board. So we have really uh, spent a lot of time uh, doing things for that, for, for those that just need a helping hand, a little bit of encouragement, and especially the poorest of the poor. We've gotten involved in some wonderful programs at the World Bank and so on. So, you know, along with the, the stuff we, we do with our church, and of course, we just love spending time with our grandkids. We are so lucky we have two, and they only live three blocks away. So we get to babysit and pick him up at school. We, we're going to have a sleepover tonight with little Lucas, our four-year-old grandson. And so life is very, very good. I think that's fantastic. And now, you know, while reading your bio and even, you know, me reflecting back upon being in that audience, I mean, you're a, a very positive energy guy and you share it openly and it has a huge impact on a lot of folks. And I oftentimes think that that could also be potentially you know, misperceived, misrepresented in a couple different ways. First of all, that, hey, it's just bringing a lot of positive energy and that's all you need to do. But really, when you start thinking about business setting and even in a home, there's a lot of impactful results, you know, that you get from this. And, and a lot of times people think about the intangibles in business, these soft skills that are hard to measure. But right in the book, and I, and I shared with you earlier, I think we need to just continue to emphasize business results happen when you actually behave, feel, connect in this way. So what kind of business impacts do you see? 
You know, it, it's so interesting that you bring that up because it, we say, you know, the soft stuff is the hard stuff, right? Um, the diff- we've been studying leadership, as you have, for well over 20 years now. And when we looked at the difference between the good leaders and the extraordinary leaders, it was never their hard skills, right? The hard skills are a given. You've got to know the products, the services, you've got to know the business. The difference was always what we have come to call their soft skills, how they communicate, how they paint the vision, how they engage people. What was fascinating for us is number one in those skills was how they express gratitude. And that was really revealing to us because, you know, as you, as you talk about servant leadership, as you talk about creating engaging cultures, you want those not just so that your mama can say, boy, aren't you a good boy, <laughs> right? You want it because it attracts and retains the top talent. It, it creates a, a culture of innovation and agility. You know, as you take a look at positive cultures measured in any which way you want, whether it's Willis Towers Watson or Gallup or a lot of our own work, those positive workplaces, you know, their return on, on uh, equity, their return on investment is sometimes three, four, five times those cultures that don't. And so as we wrote Leading with Gratitude, it was really interesting for us to not only look at the data and have those engaging stories that everybody remembers, it was also to give people the tools and the methodology and the roadmap that says, you can do this too. Is it easy? Anything that's worthwhile is never that easy. Uh, Does it bear incredible business results? Absolutely, it does. And I think the nice part of that is it's also, it also breeds good people. It creates a a, a very caring and supportive workplace. And, you know, who doesn't want that? Well, most definitely. And, and, you know, to get into some of those, you know, specifics when you start talking about this performance piece, um, I mean, you're talking about two to three times greater profitability you're talking about an average 20% higher customer satisfaction right. uh, and significantly higher scores in employee engagement, including vital metrics uh, like trust and accountability. Uh, and so when, when I start you know, looking at all of these things, and I said, we're probably going to be talking about this forever to just really break through what the societal you know, myths are, you talk about other myths as well. But before we get into that, we're going we're gonna to share those. I, I would like you to elaborate on something that you actually present in the book called imposter syndrome. What is that? <laughs> well, you know, the imposter syndrome is the, the, the leader that shows up and thinks he or she is being the big motivator, you know, read all the books and comes in and says, hey, Jim, great job, great job. You're the best, you're the best. You're, you're number one, you're, you're the tower of Pisa, you know, kind of. And it's that, that, that imposter syndrome, that, that fake praise that it gets uh, very annoying very quickly. And so as, as we talk, and we've done a lot of executive coaching now as well, when we talk to executives about this, say, look, general praise has very little impact. Be very specific. Be positive, be specific. Be, be a coach, be, be a guide. You know, you can get, you can get just carried away with, uh, you know, the office <laughs> kind of syndrome where you think you're doing all the right things and it comes across as very much an imposter, very much not you. And, uh, and has exactly the opposite effect of what you're looking for. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It also, for me, um, I, I've tried to be more expressive in the gratitude with being something as simple as I changed the signature line in my emails. And, I, and I, instead of saying thanks or cheers or whatever, um, you know, I'll put grateful. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, or in appreciation. Uh, and so it at least it shows people that, you know, I do start from that, you know, as a, as a, an intent. And then over time, and I think this is the key, over time, they'll actually see it reflected in the things that I do and being genuine. And I think that's what you're talking about with this imposter syndrome piece is, first of all, if you start down that path, you know that you need to be genuine and be consistent because it can't be something that you do temporarily and then fall off the cliff because that whole trust and accountability and ownership has a waterfall impact. No question. You know, we, we, we talk often, what's easier to change behavior or perception? And actually, it's behavior. You know, the, the fact is that the perception, as you said, takes a long time. You have to live it and breathe it over a long period of time. And then you get people believing it's, it's who you are. You know, back to creating those, those, those great metrics, we, uh, we've often seen where, you know, you preach great customer service and great loyalty, and yet you treat your people badly, you know, and, and we always say, look, the, the customer experience will never exceed the employee experience. 
you know, if your employees feel valued and engaged, if they believe in the products, if they understand, you know, what they do matters, they make a difference, and you notice that difference and celebrate it. Well, before the phones ring and the, and the emails come in, and the, you know, you do a lot of work at contact centers before that all happens, they're already coming from a very positive place. Does that ripple through to your customers? Of course it does. Of course it does. So, you know, again, coming back to, are these soft skills? Yeah. Are they nice to have? Absolutely not. <laughs> they are absolute must haves. If you're going to create that customer loyalty and the customer experience that will differentiate you from, from your competitors. I wanted to make sure we got that in because to me, that's the difference between just saying we have a great place to work and Hey, you're great. And then putting in place those things that actually will bear that fruit and, and convince people that you really are a good guy, Jim. <laughs> oh, most definitely. And I think what you're talking about too there and, and doing that connection and understanding those motivators, and we're going to get a little bit more of that in detail. But uh, Susan Fowler, uh, who is, you know, written several books about this whole employee engagement piece, she talks about uh, having motivational junk food, you know, and the motivational junk food is that high level, generic, general, you know, hey, let's give everybody a gift certificate, you know, that kind <laughs> right, of thing. Right. And you check the box, right? Well, what do you mean we don't appreciate you? Didn't you get that $5 Starbucks card? Come on. Yeah. You know? Okay. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I think it is important to mention that there are a lot of these societal myths, junk food uh, that take place uh, in a lot of different ways and that they become just part of our, you know, typical everyday practices that we really need to pay, pay attention to uh, and question. And so you talk about seven myths that are holding leaders back. And the seven you mention are fear is the best motivator. Right. People want too much. There's just no time for this. Uh, I'm not wired to feel it. I save my praise for the deserved. Uh, <laughs> it's all about the money. And they'll think that I am bogus. Right. So when I think about these seven, I have to think that there's maybe one or two that are most corrosive in an environment than others. Which ones kind of stand out for you? You know, in each one of them, I think, you know, if you've worked for any length of time, you've had every one of those bosses, <laughs> right? I think the fear one is by far the most corrosive. Um, and what's, what's interesting, as we took a deep dive into that, what we discovered is a lot of managers that manage by fear don't realize that they're managing by fear. They think they're being honest and open. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not negative. I'm, I'm candid. You know, I'm not, a, a, I'm not corrosive. I'm a truth teller. And they'll say things like, well, you know, if we don't hit these quotas, I don't know that I can guarantee your jobs. You know, I'm just being honest and open. <laughs> you go, oh, you're scaring the crap out of everybody. What are you talking about? You know, because um, it's not often that you have the, you know, the leader that'll come and stick, stick the, your finger in your face and say, you know, if you don't get this done, that does happen. It's fairly rare. It's that passive aggressive, you know, fear that I think drives people crazy. The other one that I, that I, I or two other ones we can talk about really quick. The one is, is that people need too much praise these days. You know, I, I reserve my praise for those that really deserve it. And, you know, I don't say thank you very often. I don't make people feel good very often. When I do, they, they know I mean it. You know, I remember back in 1984, you know, <laughs> when I said, shock the masses, right? And this idea that, you know, every engagement, this, 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 uh, you know, this imposter syndrome has to be something grand. You know, it's got to be, you know, fireworks and brass bands and red carpets. You know, what we're saying is, is in this leading with gratitude is often it's the small little things. It's the little gestures asking about your, your, your sick uh, mother or uh, asking about your kids and making accommodations and, and, and those kinds of things. Just genuinely caring about people. You know, I remember I had a buddy. I said, what was the best recognition you ever got? He, pulled, he was a, a chemist at a pharmaceutical company here in New Jersey. And he, he pulled out this little handwritten note out of his wallet from a, a chemist that he had worked with that was a Nobel Prize winner. And he says, this little note from him has meant more to me than anything. And I asked him, how long you had that in your wallet? He goes, 15 years. You know, so if you, those, those little things. And then lastly, I want to get to really quick, because I know time is precious, is this idea that I don't have time. And it drives me crazy. Because I'll say, now, let me get this straight. Uh, you don't have time to, to you know, value and appreciate and, and show gratitude to Susan, who is killing it. You know, because we've got to get things done. He goes, yeah, that's right. I said, okay, now, she screws up. She makes a mistake. How much time you got for her now? Oh, I'm on that like a duck on a June bug. You know, it's, which I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that means, by the way. Anyway, it's, it's you know, you, you, you say, look, 
I don't have time for the good things. I've always got time for the bad things. Well, what kind of culture do you think that breeds? You know, it's, it's really interesting to me that we, when we can reverse that dynamic and say, I make sure to have time for all the little things that are going right, I will guarantee you fewer things will go wrong. And when they do go wrong, people are quick to pipe up and ask for help and get it solved and move on. So, you know, those three to me are, you know, leading by fear, whether you know it or not, right? People need too much praise and gratitude. Can you ever get too much is my question. Ask, ask your kids, right? And then, and then lastly, I don't have the time. Well, the great leaders, the extraordinary leaders, they, they find that time. And they make sure that that's a part of their routine. And, and those are some of the things that we teach in the book because these myths are easily debunked. And when you do, and you understand not only the math and the science, you understand the emotion behind it. Boy, really good things happen really fast. Well, and as you're talking, I'm starting to see all this even flow externally. Because, I mean, we see the same thing occur when we start talking about the customer experience. When, you know, hey, you're just telling me that you love everybody's um, business, right? You're just right. telling me but you don't know anything. And then you also try this, you know, mass personalization thing. And, you know, a lot of times we feel the bigger the organization, you know, the less heart that it has. And, and the fact is, is that when you tear it all down and you can talk about this later in a book is that ultimately all of this, whether it's internal, meaning employee, colleague, you know, or external customer, it ultimately comes down to some type of peer, peer to peer connection and one-on-one and -on -one connection, isn't it? Yes, and, and that's one of the things that we point out that's, that's uh, again, a misnomer, is that gratitude has to flow downhill. It's, you know. Now, I agree that the leaders uh, set the tone, you know, and the way they behave gives everyone else permission to act the same way. So I'm not minimizing the fact that it really does need to start at the top. Where it gets really good is when it's peer-to-peer, -peer. you know, when it's your coworkers that are stepping up. Because, you know, as, as the leader, as the supervisor, you, there's no way you can see everything that's going on. And that's one of the things that, that leaders say to us, well, what if I miss somebody? So rather than, you know, miss someone, uh, it's better that I just do nothing. <laughs> you go, yeah, well, can you hear yourself? You know, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. So once you get the coworkers buying in and expressing gratitude to each other and giving that, those little pats on the back, well, that's, that's culture, right? That's everybody. That's not just top down. And that's a very important concept for people to understand. Well, most definitely. And I think, you know, we're talking also, too, about the flow of this being away. Um, and what I mean by this is that, you know, it also has to be requested, meaning that as a person who is working with others, and it doesn't matter the connection up, down, sideways, or whatever, I think it's also fair to express to others that, hey, this is how I like to be appreciated. Uh, and then people know that. I mean, keeping it under the hood, you know, or in your pocket is just not appropriate either. Exactly. We, we talk about tailoring the experience. You know, so, so when we get into the best practices, we say, look, they're seeing what's going on so important and then expressing it. Well, you're talking about the expressing it. And you want to express it in a way that's meaningful to that person. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't want to send a great big, you know, bottle of wine to a very devout Baptist family and say, you know, the, the gesture is going to be appreciated. The execution is horrible, you know, or a, a honey baked ham to a very devout Jewish family. You know, this, and, and we laugh and yet all these things have happened, right? They've all happened, right? So tailoring the experience and really understanding what is valuable, you know, for someone early in their career, it might actually be more work right, working on a product development or maybe sending them to a conference. Uh, you know, depending where you are in your life, it may be give me a little extra time off to spend with my family. I got little kids at home. You know, and it's, it's, it's the leaders that understand that to tailor the experience, they know their people, they know their stories, they know what they value. Then that recognition goes a long way. And again, can be simple gestures. You know, let me fill in for you so you can leave a little early to get to your kid's, you know, t-ball game or whatever it might be. Those are, and, and we know those leaders too. And those are the leaders that we always went the extra mile for, right? Most definitely. So, and, and I think what we're getting to is in the part of the book, you draw out um, the ability to execute upon all this. And we've kind of hit this right. a little bit, but let, let's at a, at a high level kind of group these things. So you talk about expressing, um, that's the area in the book. And so it's about being consistent, being in, individualized, connecting to core values, uh, and then making it peer to peer. So that's how, that's how you actually group these. And so we've hit on a couple of those, but you know, when you start again, where, where, if I, if I am having particular issues in any particular area and I'm looking at consistent individualized connected to core and all that, 
you know, where do I need to make sure that I do not fail? Well, I, I think it comes back very much to understanding each member of your team and their role. And we talk about walking in their shoes. You know, let's, let's take a look and see what does their day really look like so that we're not making, you know, demands that are, there's no way it's going to happen, right? Just if you understand. We, we had a really interesting experience with a, with a hospital in, in Dallas where they took the executives and said, look, let's, let's look at the experience of the hospital from the patient's view. So what they did is they put them in wheelchairs. And they said, look, you got to spend the day in a wheelchair. How easy is this place to navigate? The signs are too high, right? They're, they're not very clear. Um, people are, are talking down to you all the time. In fact, the check-in desk, if you came in in a wheelchair, there, there, was, there was no way you could, you, you had to have somebody do it for you. So, so this idea of really walking in your, in your employee shoes and understanding what it is that's going on with them. I, I love too what you talked about, solicit their input. Say, look, you know, what, what can we do to, to make your job more effective? Well, what can we do to empower you to serve our, our customers better? Nobody knows that better than the people on the front line. I mean, you know this from contact centers. You know, talk to us about your equipment. I mean, can you hear the people that are calling in? You know, is that, would that be helpful? You know, and so as, as you talk about making those connections and then to the core values, really making sure that you walk and talk the core values. If it really is about innovation, if it really is about speed, if it really is about customer service, let's make sure that what we do continues to, to tie back to those core values. Making, you know, connecting those dots is so critical. Well, and in a book, uh, and we're not going to go through all of these, but you made it to be much more clear in regards to what specifically are we talking about when we're looking at motivators to connect it, when we're looking at all right. of these things in order to be able to execute. And like I said, there, there's 23, uh, get the book and you'll be able to get them all. But there are things like, you know, autonomy, challenge, creativity, you know, service, social response, all these things. All these things are essentially individual elements or variables that reside within people when you start talking about aligning them with their work, aligning them with their company, aligning them with their own personal purpose, you know, and, and therefore helping them to draw and make that connection and you being aware of it, I, to me, I, taught, I, I think that's where your financial performance is going to hit. Now, again, from being a genuine person, you don't want to manipulate or look at it from that perspective. You really want to look at as being able to affect and impact everybody's well-being. Exactly. You know, we, we have a database now of about a million engagement surveys that we've collected over the years, which is amazing. We developed our own assessment, which is the motivators assessment. That's what you're talking about. We, we saw there was an interesting opportunity for, you know, love Myers-Briggs, who you are, right? Strength finder is what I'm good at. We wanted to fill a little niche that says, what am I passionate about? And when you get those concentric circles coming together, you know, the, your classic Venn diagram of, I know who I am, I know what I'm good at and I marry it with my passions. Well, now you've got high engagement. So the, the, again, the extraordinary leaders take the time to say, look, what really are your key motivators? Oddly enough, uh, we had some really interesting ahas. One of them, now I grew up in sales. And so I, you know, I, love the, I love the whole transaction. I love being the servant, you know, finding the problem, solving the problem with your product. What was fascinating to a lot of people is you would think that your top salespeople, that money is their number one motivator. It's rarely the case. In fact, it is really rarely the case that that's the motivator. They're very service oriented. You know, they're very, uh, uh, relationships are very important and, and on and on. So being able to, to contextualize that and share those with each other again, and, and you want a lot of diversity on your team and not just diversity that we traditionally think of, you know, age and, and gender and race and so on. You want diversity in thought. You want people that are very socially, uh, uh, social, uh, uh, active in their communities. You want people that are family oriented. You want people where money is important because money is important, right? And, and on and on. And when you, when you bring that dynamic together, the way that you can then uh, express that gratitude and build really a team that, that gets each other, again, not just top down, also peer to peer, that's where it gets really good. I'm really glad that you, you, you picked up on that because the personalization of the workplace experience gets really important. And the only way you can personalize it is if you know people's stories and you really know intrinsically and emotionally what motivates them. Talking about those leaders that can do that, those are the ones that we give even more for. And but we, I think for me, it's important too, when we start talking about the whole being able to do it, you know, be consistent, 
uh, sustain it, you know, like, you know, instead of just doing it for a temporary time, all of that is we ultimately have to bring it back home. Exactly. You know, and we never met and, and we interviewed some of the most remarkable leaders in this book. Never once did we find a leader that led with gratitude and led to extraordinary results that didn't intentionally practice gratitude in their personal lives. And that was very affirming for me because it, it, it dispels that imposter syndrome. You know, oh, oh, she's that way at work. Well, she should see her at home. And the opposite. I was coaching an executive really interesting and he needed to work on his relationships. And he said, you know, what's really interesting is in my personal life, I'm very good at this. In the workplace, I'm much more standoffish for whatever reason. It was kind of maybe the way he was managed, the way he was was brought up. And I said, you know what, we got to we got to break down that barrier because I don't want you to have a work life and a personal life. I want you to have just a great life. And, and that, that makes, uh, makes such a difference. So bringing it home, and we had some great best practices. Would you care to hear a few? Please do, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, Dave Kirpin, a good friend of ours, has a remarkably successful um, branding company in New York. He said, you know, it was so interesting. I kept hearing about this gratitude package. I said, no way, soft, it's soft. He says, I kept hearing so much of that. There's probably something to it. So he started doing his business. And then he said, how can I take this home? Well, they got two kids. And he said, around the dinner table, it was classic at the end of the day. And he says, you know, we try to eat dinners together as often as we can, you know, with kids' schedules. He said, we'd say, so uh, how was your day? Fine. What did you do at school? Nothing. You know, like classic. So we changed that dynamic. And we said, you have to answer these three questions. First off, what was the best part of your day? That's a great question. Everybody's had something that happened that was great. Secondly, who are you grateful for that's not at the table? And thirdly, who are you grateful for at the table that hasn't been thanked yet? So everybody gets thanked, right? And everybody gets, he says at first it was, oh, dad, it's another one of your things. You know, you read a book or something, right? Now, like you said, consistency over time that this is what they do. And so he says, what's really cute is when they bring friends over for dinner, they said, now be ready. What's the best part of your day? You're grateful. And he said, it's changed the dynamic and, and brought this sort of love and positivity into our family that we didn't have before. That simple little tweak. I, I just love that one. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, man, I can tell you that you getting the, like I said, getting a chance to see you, having you on the show. I um, mean, your, I mean, your energy and your positivity is impactful and it is consistent. I mean, it's genuine. I mean, you, this is your life. So I can imagine, you know, having that real time promo and watching you all day long, it would be fantastic <laughs> for so many people to experience. But, you know, when we look at all of this, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that inspire us. You're an inspiration to many. So thank you. Uh, but there's quotes that we look at on the show to kind of help direct us and point us and help us reflect. Is there a quote or two that you'd like that you can share? Yeah, you know, um, I quote my dad a lot. And uh, I love it. He used to say, you know, Chess, happiness is a choice. Choose to be happy. You know, and I, I love that. Another one, we, we worked with, um, with uh, Becky, who, who works with these um, uh, uh, camps in India for leper colonies. And she said, you know, you'd see these people in the most dire of circumstances, and yet they were so happy. And he said, you know, they were grateful for the things that they had, not, not upset about the things they didn't have. And she said, you know, the lessons that I learned in these leper colonies was that gratitude has nothing to do with your circumstances and everything to do with your heart. And I love that quote. It has nothing to do with your circumstances and everything to do with your heart. You know, the most giving people that I know aren't the most wealthy or the, or the most, you know, um, you know, gifted. They're those people that really care about others. And then lastly, Brene Brown, who I'm sure you've, you've, you've read, is a remarkable leader. She said, you know, often we think that, that uh, joy, our joy will drive our gratitude. And she says, it's just the opposite. It's our gratitude that makes us happy. And so those are, those are three quotes that we, we cite in the book that I think are great. And lastly, I want to tell you a cute story about my dad because he just was the happiest guy I ever knew. So, you know, grew up in a, a faith-based family and did a lot of volunteer work at church. And he, he did a lot of work with the youth in our congregation. And there's always that one, you know, curmudgeonly unhappy person in the congregation that wants you to be as miserable as they are, right? And this was the case. So after church, this, this older woman came up to my dad and she put her finger in his face and said, you know, Mr. Elton, you think that all the young people in this congregation just love you. Well, I'm here to tell you, they don't. And he says to her, well, thank you. And she says, it wasn't a compliment. And he said, without skipping a beat, he goes, too late. 
<laughs> it's just, I, just, I love my dad. No matter what you said to him, he took it as a compliment. And I think that's just a, just a great way to live. You know, be, be grateful, be giving, choose to be happy and understand that if you want a joyful life, it's not the joy and the accomplishments that drives your gratitude. It's the gratitude that jo- drives a joyful life. And I think those are words to live by. Oh, most definitely. However, there are times where it just doesn't happen, right? I mean, exactly. life takes over sometimes. It overwhelms us. And we talk about getting over the hump on the show. Uh, so <laughs> can you help us uh, with some uh, inspiration in regards to sharing with us a time where you've gotten over the hump? Yeah, you know, it was really interesting. I, I uh, you know, I, most of my career I've, I've spent in New York. And I, I love New York. And everything good and everything bad you can find in New York, right? And because of the pressure and the pace in New York, you'd get to the position, uh, the, the point where you would, if something went wrong, you vilified the person and you became a victim. And one of the things that really got me over the hump is a good friend of mine, uh, Scott O'Neill, we actually put some of his stuff in our book where he said, you know, assume positive intent. Now, don't assume that people are out to get you, right? Assume that there's stuff going on for them. Like if you don't hear back from them right away, look, they're busy people too. Uh, you know, it could just genuinely be an honest mistake. Don't assume that they got up in the morning and said to themselves, how can I make Chester's life miserable today? You know, and so that for me was really getting over the hump. And when you do have people that have done you wrong, and it does happen, uh, my good friend Marshall Goldsmith said to me, he says, you know, Chester, I would rather be the guy that bought the Brooklyn Bridge than the guy that sold the Brooklyn Bridge. And you think about that for a minute. I'd rather have been taken advantage of than be the guy who is an out and out crook. So be grateful for the fact that you're not the guy that sold the Brooklyn Bridge. Be grateful for the, the that you just made a, a horrible choice, right? And those, those things have really helped me get over the hump. Assume positive intent about people and be grateful, you know, for, for those things that you have. And when people do take advantage of you, you know what? That's on them. Don't, don't let that break your heart. Uh, move on and, and continue to be about good works. Does that, does that make sense? It does make sense. And then for me, being someone who um, is strong in faith as well, I mean, I always try to put that one in God's bucket. I'm like, he'll take care of that. Exactly. Exactly. When everything else falls short, there's always somebody you can call on. <laughs> Most definitely. Okay. So, but I know you, I mean, you're a prolific writer, prolific speaker, prolific positive impact person. All of these things are going on, right? Uh, the grandkids living three blocks away. I mean, fantastic <laughs> things going on. However, you know, we still have to have some type of guiding light focus. You know, when we talk about goals, I mean, if we were to talk about all these things that are, you know, guiding you and where you're going, I mean, what's one of your goals that you can share with us? You know, it, it, that's such a deep question. <laughs> There's a lot in that question. You know, I, I, uh, you know, I have my morning prayers. A lot of people that I know, you know, have their morning meditation. I just think that's so important to reflect on, you know, what happened, you know, what, what did we set out to do? What happened? What did we learn? What are we going to take forward? And, you know, in my morning uh, prayers and meditation, uh, the thing that really drives me is to be kind. And I know that sounds really simple and really fluffy. I just think that particularly in the world we live in now, where we've got so much digital junk that comes at us every day, the the news is just prolifically, you know, negative. And yet there's never been a better time to live than now. You know, uh, life expectancy is up. You know, think of all the things that travel as the world is so small. There's just amazing connections. And so many people, I think, are, are they've never been more connected and never felt more alone. And because of that, I think it really is incumbent on us that, that are so blessed. And, you know, I have a ridiculously wonderful wife and four great kids and grew up in a ridiculously happy house. I've never had to worry about, was I going to eat today? You know, those kinds of things. I mean, there are people in the world with real problems and they're not me. Is to really sit back in the morning and say, look, how can I really assume positive intent about everyone that I engage today? And how can I do those little random acts of kindness that hopefully will be those little things that will uplift someone today, whether it's in, in, in something that we write, in, in an area where we speak, um, helping somebody just get their bag up in the overhead on a plane, or opening a door for someone, or a little piece of candy for a kid. You know, you mentioned our carrots that we throw all over the place. And I always keep a couple of extra carrots in my bag for the plane. 
because there's going to be some kid that's upset, you know, and expressing how we all feel uh, by screaming at the top of their lungs. And isn't it fun to just have a little fuzzy carrot to give to a, a stressed out mom? Or what I love is when you give it to the flight attendants that have really gone above and beyond and just cheer somebody up. I, I, I know this all sounds kind of fluffy. Uh, for me, it's really not because I've been in those situations where I've just been having a really tough day. And a simple act of kindness by a stranger just meant the world to me. And I think as we start to build business cultures, we build family cultures, we build our communities, that attitude of random acts of kindness, let's be kind to each other, let's choose to be happy, is just the, 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 the foundation of good work, good business, you know, and, and a good life. And so I hope I didn't sound too preachy on that. Although I have been dubbed the apostle of appreciation and I'm going to stick to it. My brother can I get an amen, you know? <laughs> well, no, I thought that was fantastic. And thank you for sharing. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Chester, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Chester Elton, are you ready to hoe down? I'm ready to hoe down. Let's All go. Right. All right. <laughs> so what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? You know, I just don't manage my time as well as I should. I, I've got to be a better time management person. You know, I, I get up and I go, oh, man, I should have done that yesterday. You know, so time management. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? You know, assume positive intent. That was the best leadership advice I ever got. Don't, don't vilify people. Assume that they're as busy as you are. Be positive. Move forward. And what is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? Uh, my amazing wife. <laughs> There's no question about it. She's ridiculously supportive. And, and Christy Lawrence, who runs my calendar, I remember getting off a plane and calling her and said, Christy, I, it's obvious I'm in Las Vegas. I just don't know why. Uh, those, those people, you know, those support groups, my wife and Christy, without question. And what is one of your tools that helps you lead in business or life? You know, I think it's random acts of kindness. It really is. It's, you know, getting to know people, being kind, having a little positive something to leave behind in every interaction that I go through. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? It could be for any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to Leading with Gratitude on your show notes page as well. And we'll also put a link uh, to your author page as well. Excellent. You know, uh, my wife and I have read this wonderful book by Priya Parker. You should look her up. She's got an amazing TED Talk on the art of gathering. Uh, why we meet and why it's important. And I, we've loved it. It's changed the way we've brought our families together for family dinners and vacations. We often get caught in the logistics of why we meet, who are we going to invite, where are we going to go, what the food. We lose sight of why we're gathering. And let's engage people's minds and help us solve problems. We had a wonderful family dinner when we said, at the dinner, we want you to think about two things. Something you accomplished this year that you're really proud of, and something that the family can help you accomplish this year. And it changed the conversation from, oh, that's a lovely blouse you're wearing, or boy, this, this food tastes great. You should say those things. It got deeper and more meaningful. So Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, highly recommend it. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Chester Elton. Okay, Chester, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25. You can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take them all. You can only take one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? You know, the piece of knowledge that I would take back is at 25, I would have found a mentor. I would have found a coach. You know, I think at 25, I was just so head down, charging forward, get her done, get the raise, get the promotion. I didn't think about developing as a leader. And now that I'm an executive coach and I've been executive coach, I thought, man, if I could have had a coach like that, a mentor like that at 25, I'd be way ahead of where I am now. I'm a big believer in mentors and coaches. Chester, I've had a great time with you today, but how can the Fast Leader Legion connect with, connect with you? You know, connect with me on LinkedIn. We got all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, thecultureworks.com is our, our main company where we, you know, we teach and we train all kinds of fun stuff there for free as well. Um, if you're ever in the New York area, uh, don't come to my house. <laughs> uh, look, look us up, though. We have great fun. And you know where you can always find me is at a New Jersey Devils hockey game. So look for the guy wearing orange. 
Chester Elton, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. <laughs>